CG 4577 Musical 1956, 1957. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This radio model was built in Italy by FIAR with the brand CGE around the years 1956-1957. That was done presumably at Barenzate, today part of Milan, in the same factory where products with the brand Telefunken were still made, also by FIAR. Therefore, the components were the same, and often also the design. There is another CG musical model with the number 4587. The difference is in the choice of the FM tuner using the ECC 85 instead of the type UCC-85. The model 4577 appears in the ANI catalog 1956-1957, while the other one is mentioned in the next edition, 1957-1958. The model of the radio under restoration 4577 has the chassis and the schematic diagram identical to the model Telefunk in Domino, are 152. The radio arrived still in working condition, but not safe. The chassis of the item under restoration had significant signs of corrosion under and above. Knowing that the item had been kept with great care that must have been caused by the explosion of some component containing caustic substances, and consequently the radio must have been repaired. The most important area with significant corrosion was under the chassis around the power transformer. Later removing the power transformer to clean the area from rust, it was possible to notice that also on the surfaces covered by the transformer, there were those signs, while the transformer was not stained. So the transformer found in the unit could not have witnessed that damaging event. Otherwise, it should have carried some significant discoloration and staining. The original schematic diagram for the unit under restoration is available on radiomuseum.org, but the one for the Telefunken R152 is the same. The schematic diagram of the model 4587 is clearer, and it has been patched and annotated to match the model under restoration. Here you see the final schematic diagram, including a little modification for a better safety that will be described later. A better detailed picture is available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. This radio model, and also the successor, have a power transformer used as isolation transformer, but also as auto transformer. In practice, the secondary winding, isolated from the mains, provides the AC high voltage that is then rectified to get the B+. But the tube filaments do not have their own winding, and they are connected in couples partly to the secondary and partly to the primary winding. In other words, four tubes out of seven have their filaments powered without isolation from the mains. Under the circumstances, a defective tube that shows a leakage between filament and cathode could put the chassis in contact with the mains. One thing that should not be underestimated is that also the dial light bulb is connected to the mains and its terminals are exposed above the chassis. Therefore, the chassis might be considered somewhat safe, but not the dial light that would be instead a major risk problem. In the same way, the terminals of the magic eye should not be touched when the power plug is inserted in the wall socket. 
CG, and Telefunken radios produced in Italy shared a common tuning method. They used variable inductors instead of variable capacitors. The mechanism used in these radios is particularly delicate because the ferrite cores are moved using a thin cord that is not easily replaceable when it wears off. In the unit under restoration, the original cord tensor was replaced with a pulley during a previous repair, which however didn't have the required spring tension. Without spring tension, the two ferrite cores, one for the antenna tuning coil and the other for the oscillator coil, didn't move synchronously, because when one was pulled, the other was loose for a little while. That made tuning to a station very difficult in the beginning. Therefore, the original adaptation of the spring tensor had to be readapted, putting the small pulley on a piece of metal with some spring tension. The dial glass of the unit under restoration has been scanned and it is available with better detail in the written documentation that comes along with this video. It is remarkable that the dial pointer cannot travel the entire dial scale, which makes the latter decorative instead of useful. This video clip shows how to install the dial glass. The metal pins that would hold the glass had special grommets that have become very hard by now. They have been replaced with pieces of regular round grommets. The diffuser should have been installed before the dial glass. This clip shows the condition of the radio under the chassis after some cleaning, but before the electrical restoration. It should be observed that the design implied to connect components on the fly without dedicated posts. Because there were different layers of components, while replacing the paper capacitors, small ceramic equivalents have been chosen when available to gain space and making it easier to proceed with the electrical restoration. The electrolytic can has been removed and in its place a small board with three capacitors has been put. The big stain of rust has been treated with a gel rust remover. To obtain more space under the chassis in the power supply area, the input voltage selector has been removed considering that the radio needed an adaptation to be able to operate comfortably with 230 240 volts which would have made the voltage selection completely useless anyway in Europe the domestic mains provides about 230 volts while this radio was made for maximum 220 volts three halogen light bulbs have been put together in series with the supply line but in parallel with themselves to drop some voltage, and two fuses have been added too.
counting on the protection of the fuses, for safety the chassis has been connected to the external ground. The fuses have been installed on a plastic box, and the halogen light sockets on a board put on top of the same box. The box has been installed on the chassis with the help of a bracket that was soldered on the chassis using a low melting point solder alloy containing tin and bismuth. To work on the cabinet, it is important to remove the loudspeaker front panel first. It should be noticed that at the bottom of this panel there is a long brass bar that comes insulated from the factory with some duct tape. The rest of the cabinet is very fragile, more like the sound box of a string instrument. The thickness is about 5 millimeters, and everything else that appears thicker is just a frame that keeps the cabinet together. There are no specific pictures about what has been done to the cabinet. Some lacquer thinner has been used to smooth in the original lacquer without stripping it. Then red oil first and dark brown wax last have been used to polish the surface. While using the lacquer thinner, also the white plastic frame on the front has been cleaned. The grill cloth was stained and partly torn. Therefore, it has been removed to replace it with some velvet of a compatible color. For that, the long brass bar had to be removed too.
the long brass bar was fixed with rivets. Here screws are used, but they should remain covered by the grill cloth. At this point, the loudspeaker panel is reinstalled, but the internal insulation for the brass bar is still missing. That is a mistake, and the insulation will be added later. Here is what happens if the brass bar at the bottom of the loudspeaker panel is not insulated. It could get in touch with the Magic Eye terminals, which includes the B+, or the mains from the filament. Because here the Magic Eye filament is connected to the primary winding of the power transformer. But also the connection with the chassis should be avoided. Therefore, the upper pins holding the dial glass should also be taken care of. For the purpose of isolating the chassis, also the screws holding it at the bottom of the cabinet should be covered. The screws inserted in the wood should not be too long, otherwise they would make contact with the chassis. Also the hole in the back panel that formerly was used to access the input voltage selector should be closed. Even though theoretically the chassis is isolated, some leakage is to be expected, and that would make it unsafe. The unit under restoration has been modified so that the chassis can be connected to the external ground. However, if the leakage becomes excessive, that would trip the residual current circuit breaker. Under the circumstances, the user of the radio might be tempted to power it by omitting the external ground, making dangerous the contact with the chassis. Hence, isolating the chassis from the operator remains necessary. Before considering doing an alignment, it has been verified if that was needed, at least for the AM reception. According to the original documentation, the intermediate frequency is 468 kHz, and it has been checked with a non-modulated slow sweeping signal between 458 and 478 kHz. The bell curve red at the AVC line appears upside down on the oscilloscope, but what it shows is that there is no need for an alignment. The FM appeared working correctly, and it has not been touched as well. Considering the poor AM tuning system and the dial scale that doesn't match the dial indicator movement, considering that the reception was good, no dial alignment has been done as well. This type of radio, like other CG and Telefunken models of the same period, is not properly shielded in the RF section. It seems appropriate to try and shield, somehow, the mixer converter tube and the IF amplifier tube. Some aluminum foil is used, connected to the chassis with the help of a tinted copper wire.
Here you see the process of putting together the radio at the end of the restoration. The loudspeaker DIN connectors were added for practical reasons because originally the loudspeaker was not separable from the chassis. A chassis is held with four screws inserted under the cabinet. For safety reasons, they should also be covered as described earlier in this video. Some felt is added between the dial glass and the knobs. Before installing the knobs, they have been carefully cleaned with a metal polish and thin iron wool. Unfortunately, one knob came without a brass decoration ring. Here is the collection of replaced parts. This radio absorbs about 250 milliamps, but the fuses that have been installed are type F0.1 amps, and they don't blow. In fact, in the absence of surges, they would blow only after 800 milliamps. Here is a demonstration. Here you can see that at 800 milliamps, the fuse starts to become red, but at the end of the test, without trespassing that current value, the fuse is still working correctly. This unit has current limiting light bulbs, which under normal conditions would not allow a sufficient current surge that would blow these fuses. The CG4577 musical is ready. System. The test is done in the early evening using an indoor wire antenna and it starts from the lower frequency band medium wave proceeding up to the FM band. Thank you. 
intanto questo Adam di Bredoio ha difeso l'attività del personale subordinato Esiste sute, mille di azioni che sono risultate in tattur di... Ci sono centinaia di migliaia di azioni Le ministre a souligné que le gouvernement avait adopté Il lavoro carburante da 50 anni e via via nel tempo. 
If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics equipment or old radios in whatever condition they might be, provided that you do not feel any attachment that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation and video production.